Okay, so maybe. Uh, <laughs> I've laughed, dude. I really should like do better about like getting people to be close to the mics and like helping you guys do it. Like as a as a producer, that should be part of my job. No, like we're good. You but just get it and then don't move. I've laughed that it feels like I'm pulling up like my little kid's pants. Like it feels so <laughs> degrading to like reach over the table and like move someone's microphone. Like it feels violating, and it's so like healthy and normal. But no, I th- if this is your thing, and if you needed to be good then just grab the mic that's what i should do you but can pull down my pants too you, you can pull up my pants if you want or down it literally it feels you like want. yeah you're the mom who like walks their toddler in public and like adjusts their pants and you're like mom stop like mom, stop that's it. i feel like i'm giving you guys that feeling i know how to talk into a microphone <laughs> yeah it's like you guys are all bad people you guys all know how microphone works like i feel like i'm i'm the one who knows how this works at least like all the lighting stuff the set stuff that's all me but this part, like Dan was like, you check the switch, and it's like, dude, I, I would have been <laughs> nah. plugging everything, unplugging like, everything. I didn't even know there was a switch. I don't even think mine has. A Yours switch. doesn't, yeah. Oh, so the mine was just on. I was yeah. like, mine was on. Mine just worked. You're just better than all of us at audio. I'm just the best, dude. I sit down and stuff works immediately. Hell yeah, dude. Just, well, hell yeah. Episode twenty four. We said <laughs> we talked about that before. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah, we're on a podcast. Ah, <laughs> oh, dude, I always forget that. Um, episode twenty four. We are back here. I'm here with Dan and Ryan from Chain Twist. Another episode with two guest homies. Appreciate y'all coming through. Hell yeah, Appreciate you having us. Um, I usually tell you guys what I'm going to start with, and I'm realizing that I did not, but Roll that's okay. Um, we'll do I like, it live. Um, so I want to dive right into the music video. So at the point, you just put out two lyric videos uh, for, I'm forgetting song names. I have them written down, and I should have known okay. them. Kerosene um, and Purge. For Kerosene and Purge. So the, the reason I think that's sick is you now have three videos out for the three songs you have out, and I think that like one-to-one, I'm obviously so biased here. But I think putting out the videos for each song is such a smart thing of like make, reach into that YouTube pool, like pull some of those people into you and give them an opportunity to come find you guys. Exactly. Yeah. We already had all of the, the footage for both Kerosene and Purge because originally, originally we were going to do um, because the two songs, because the two, because the two songs um go into each other on Spotify, we were going to treat the music video kind of like the same thing and do almost like a short kind of filmish thing. So we shot all of the band stuff. We had all the band shots and then we just never really got around to fleshing out um, the story for it, which wound up essentially becoming the feral video. So we're just like, we just kind of scrapped it and we did the feral video and I liked cutting everything together so much that I was like, we already have all this stuff. I'm just going to cut everything together and then watched them both back and I was like, oh, this is kind of boring because it's literally the same black backdrop. Like there's no variety in shots at all. So I'm like, let's just, we're just going to make a lyric video, I guess. And that way it's different. It's not just here's music videos. It's something to be engaging the whole time. And it came out pretty good. So like you said, though, having everything one for one is, yeah, like we want, we wanted to have as much like accessibility for people so like people find us like oh that's that song and it's like oh there's a video for it cool Mm -hmm. yeah so definitely the goal and i think also like the people have to put out like just like the streaming video and it's like i don't think it's bad i think it's still better to put that out than not put something on youtube yeah but like the lyric video dan like gives you a chance to shine it gives you a chance like i think in a in the context of a music video like it becomes about me it becomes about the director it becomes about the band it becomes about so much and a lyric video is an interesting way for you to be like no no no. here here's what i wrote for you here's how i want you to feel it um yeah i mean Talking about the lyric videos for you, is it like a, is it gratifying to give people like a deep look into it or is it kind of like scary and overwhelming? Does it not matter at all? Is it? It's very neutral yeah. for me. Um, I don't really care too much about what people think about the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Like, cause I got, I think the initial goal for us is to write the music for us and then like let the rest be for everybody else. Um, and I assume you're doing most of the lyric writing? Yeah. Most- uh, lyric writing or instrumentals either way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess lyric videos give you, like you said, more access, more I guess accessibility too to everything that we're doing. I also think doing them in house is so smart. I, and again, that's uh, I am biased that everyone should do videos because it. And I'm also biased because I think a lot of people should do them more in house, which puts me out of job. So I'm kind of going both ways there. But I think it's smart to do it in house because it's so much more accessible, right? Like I'm not always available. You can't always have someone. And like now, you guys have something that will grow with the band. And as the band keeps growing and gets more experience, like so will the videos and all the other production as well. And then too, with that being all in house, it kind of gives you a look inside our brains too. As like, especially with Feral being our first like video that ever got released, it kind of yeah. gives you an inside like the mindset of us and like kind of like the vibe as like a, a cool like intro to us and people who are new. Obviously, because we're new, everybody's gonna be new. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't even know where I was going with that, but yeah, like having doing everything in house, like that's what we've all 
at least me, jo- um, me, Josh, and Joe, like everything we've done in terms of past projects together has always been DIY. Like even our past band, like we recorded everything like in Joe's basement and like sent it to Sean to get mixed and mastered. Like every video was all, oh, we can just do it ourselves. Like let's just save money if we can do it. So now like doing the Dead to Me video with you is like kind of like, okay, like we're gonna take this band super serious. Like this is gonna be our big step where it's like, we're going to Peter, like we're going to Jay, we're gonna do all this. We're gonna do this as big as possible. So, like, we're, as a band, like, super excited to be doing it and, like, kind of using that as, like, the stepping stone to be like, okay, like, this is this is for real now. Like, we're doing it. Hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's fun. I think I, uh, I'm very bad at taking compliments. And I think what you just said is kind of, like, a veiled compliment of, like, it's a really exciting thing to be able to give people that opportunity to do what they see as professional. And I perceive it as, like, I'm just doing the thing I've been doing for years. And it's like, no, when I started doing it, I was leeching off of people <laughs> and it's cool that I can now give back to that community and like yeah, return definitely. that favor to people. Um, I also think, yeah, in the content of the videos, it's also an interesting thing of like, it's, it's the rap model. Like it's something that we have as the metal world, we have grown to assimilate some of, and it's interesting to watch it like trickle over as the, the post Malone's and Billie Eilish's start to kind of mix the, the higher levels of music. And to me, like this trend of putting out 10 music videos for 10 songs is kind of a rap thing of like, it's always been singles heavy. They've always been quick and like, the sexy releases, whereas metal has been this big like album that is cool and exciting, but it's not as accessible to new listeners. It's not as good for getting people in. And so as when you're a new band to me, it's like, yeah, keep pumping out the videos, keep giving everyone a hook to come in and join the, the thing you guys are building. And then the other half of it too, is like kind of like what we touched on uh, last episode is nowadays people have so much access to Spotify, Apple music, whatever else exists like title where now they're just focused on, just whatever singles are out and that's what they jam like less people are listening to albums in full now so like especially in the metal world seeing that happen more is making bands get bigger because that's more music reactors they reach on youtube or like because they're not going to react to the whole album right mm-hmm. they're going to react to big singles that gets access to people who have never heard of them before or maybe don't even know the genre plus two um it's just more content to post out like rather than oh here's ten songs in one kind of like general thing, well you can't really promote every single song. I forgot to mention, yeah, you are our first returning guest. I've been looking forward to having returning, and I had like a, a soft rule that I'm going to go through twenty episodes before I let anyone come back twice. Oh, so yeah. I appreciate you coming back to the first it. first two times. Uh, yeah, we're through those through those first twenty. Um, the flip side there, to me, that's a really exciting change. To me, it's really exciting that bands are leaning towards singles, leaning towards EPs, three song, four song kind of things. Uh, to you guys, I guess that is a totally different version of the art. Like for me, that allows, gives me more work opportunity. It allows me to do what I like to do. Uh, and I think it's just a fun way for me to consume music. I think uh, that's how I prefer to consume it. But I get for an artist as someone who's producing the music, it's a totally different thing And that releasing singles is different than getting to write your masterpiece of an EP or an album. Like, where do you guys stand on that? Are you hoping to continue to release singles? Are you hoping to get to a place where an EP or an album can kind of stand and have enough momentum to make it worthwhile? I mean, we're kind of half in half out of that because like the stuff we're doing after these next like two i guess groups of songs are kind of have an unintentional theme related to each other so we there's a i don't know we're trying to decide if we want to do an ep based off that since there's like a loose concept but then again you know if what we're doing is going to work where it's like single 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 then we'll probably just do that yeah it honestly kind of hinges also too on how like these next two singles go because our whole concept, especially nowadays with things like TikTok and everything is so like quick, I need to get your attention in three seconds or like we're done. Like, especially as a local band, no one's gonna see like, oh, Chant was put out a seven song EP. Let me go listen to every single song. So like, especially if you don't know us, like no one's gonna sit down and do that. So putting out one song and it's like, hey, here's the song. Like, this, just give me three minutes of your attention if you like it cool then you'll come back for the next one hopefully if you don't then whatever you didn't waste any time mm-hmm. so it's doing singles i feel like has been really like a kind of low risk for both sides as the artist and the consumer because if you don't like it then you didn't waste an entire hour listening to an album you didn't like and if you do cool you just found your new favorite band in two minutes and <laughs> for us it works because put out one song and then if the next two songs we start to build like a fan base and oh maybe we can do three at one time and like it'd be fine so i think it also allows you guys to kind of find your sound right instead of putting out 10 100%. songs and be like this is chain twist it's like well, this is our first song and we'll write the second song and i don't i assume you guys have 
written more than the three songs that have come out. But even then, it's like it's still a growing thing. Whereas I think in an old model where you put on an album first, it's like you're kind of cementing yourself into a place and you don't get that opportunity to kind of ebb and flow and grow with whatever makes sense to you. Definitely. Um, uh, what was the other piece there of the putting out singles? Um, I don't know. That's OK. I had one last thought about the albums versus EPs and shorter singles thing. Um, but that's OK. Um, I don't know. I got to work better on keeping my thoughts in my head. <laughs> they seem to like running away from me. Um, on the topic of self-producing videos, so I know you guys have done a lot of stuff in-house in the past. Uh, Ryan, you mentioned that the three of you guys have kind of juggled it and uh, you've done some graphic design. Like, what did, How do you distribute those roles? So you're self-producing a lot of videos and a lot of content. What does that look like for you guys? Yeah, I mean, everybody kind of has fallen into their their thing. In the past, Like, it's mostly been me and Josh contributing in terms of like musically. And then Joe has a super big background in photography. So he's got a lot of gear and stuff. So it was very easy to kind of set up some stuff and he'd get his camera out and he'd get all these shots and we'd get everything kind of cut together and I would edit everything. And yeah, it kind of just works out to where everybody's got their thing. Dan will come to, for Shane Twist, Dan will come and be like, hey, I've got this song and everything kind of just comes together where people put their stuff on in it and then who's doing merch and then who's running kind of everything. So everybody's kind of fallen into like their, their role, I guess. So it's nice because in a way, everything, it works really well, just like a well-oiled machine. We come to practice and like, this is what everybody does. And everybody also has their hands in on everything. So it's not like, Oh, I can only do this. Like, don't even try. Like it's my job. Like we, we, we get along so well as a band and as friends where it's like, if someone comes up with something, he's like, I don't want to do it. And it's like, okay, well, why? And like, we can have these like arguments and discussions and it winds up just being better because it's like, oh, this is good that like we can do this and then like still be a band. Cause it's like, we all care so much that if we don't think it's the best choice, then we're not doing it. And if one person brings up a point where it's like, oh, I don't think this is right. It's like, okay, well, let's hear it out. And then we're like, okay, actually you have a point. Let's not. So it's this weird thing where like saying yes is seen as the more uh, socially appropriate thing. Yeah. And it's like just tapping everyone on the back saying you guys are doing great. And like, yeah. I love whatever Dan came up with. Like, yeah. uh, if you if you loved every song Dan sent, every single demo, it's like that is nice. It is kind to him. But it's like, is that the best interest of Chain Twist? It's like, probably not. Probably some of them are great. And at some point someone should have said, hey, Dan, let's pull, pull and, left here. And that's the thing that I like most is like if I come to the table with something that we don't like, I want to hear that we don't like it. Because this way I can be like, okay, well, for next time, let me avoid this. Or like, or we can have discussion like, okay, how can we make this into something we want to do? Which has happened quite a few times already. Yeah, I don't think there's ever been really like an instance where it's been like, cool, like someone brought something to the table, like we're done, sick. Like it's always like a discussion of it. No one ever brings something to the table with intentions of it being like, I brought this here, guys, we did it. Like it's always like, eh? (laughs) <laughs> what do we think? And then it'd be like, yeah, this is good, but, and then this is good, but, and then it just becomes like the best that can be because it's four people, everybody's input. And then that's what change twist is. So like if one of us comes in and it's like, this is what it is. That's not chain twist. It's just Dan or it's just me or it's just Josh, just show. And knowing us, if we ever have something that came to the table, it was like, everyone's really stoked on it or anything it'll just snowball into something yeah like bigger even than thing, yeah even if we don't have anything not <coughs> negative but like constructive to say like oh we can fix this it's like as we keep going it's like oh this is good and then it just winds up getting better anyway because naturally stuff just comes out as you're uh, pitching ideas is it normally uh i guess part one of this is who's normally doing the like i think there's a group chat that people are putting demos in yeah. uh who's normally doing the bulk of that and is it normally someone saying here's three minutes of a song or is it normally here's a verse does anyone have a chorus like yeah what is a, a typical version of that dan has been coming to the it's definitely stepped up to the the play here and normally just will drop a full demo like with production and like samples and stuff and be like hey i did this thing and it's like a whole song and we're okay. like rad cool we have the structure down like everything's there and then it becomes like okay well maybe this verse is like let's cut this verse in half or like oh we can make this breakdown more this but for the most part dan's kind of stepped up um with providing like the skeletons for things. And then the three of us kind of come in and kind of put our, our touches on it. Cause it's never set in stone. It's more just like, here's what's in my brain. And then like drums, I'll come in and be like, 
cool MIDI drums, but like, I'm going to maybe do this. And Josh would be like, oh, I came up with this lead and Joe does his bass and like everything kind of always builds on itself. Like I said, like we never, we never leave it as one person's like thing. It's always got to have someone's touch on it, but yeah. So it's more of, I guess, to answer your question in an actual sentence. Um, we don't answer questions <laughs> on the yeah. show. We just kind of chat yeah, we get, we get, pre- we get presented yeah. like a whole idea from, from Dan and then it becomes like chain twist through the rest of us. Oh yeah. Uh, I've joked that like, it can't be an interview because part of an interview in my brain is that an interviewer knows the answer to the question. Like you're setting someone up for success. Right. And it's like, no, I don't no, I'm genuinely like, yeah, let's chat. Let's figure it out. Let's get to the bottom of this shit. Uh, because it's such a foreign world to me. Yeah. I know one side of the band experience very, very thoroughly at this point and not, I don't know, I guess in 10 years I'm going to look back and be like, dude, I didn't know shit back then. That's probably also <laughs> true. Um, but yeah, I certainly know nothing about or very little about your side of it. Uh, Dan, is that about your summary too, that you feel like you're sending three-ish minute songs or those songs that have been like existing on a hard drive for a while that you're polishing a chain twist or these new ideas coming in? Yeah, what is? I think the only thing that was sitting for a while was kerosene. Because mm-hmm. I think I did that maybe a few years back. I think over COVID just randomly. Mm-hmm. Um, everything is that I come to the table with is very spur of the moment or if I feel like inspired by like a certain sound I'll like trying to kind of create something that encompasses that but I'm also very OCD when I have songs I'm writing that I need to like finish it before mm-hmm. I even send it out because I'm like I don't want to send something unfinished and have like the wrong vibe that goes with it oh um, dude I'm so glad you said that uh Sorry, I'm totally interrupting you, but I have the same thing with video of like, I don't want you to make a judgment based on a thing that I didn't mean for you to judge. So in video for me, it's color. It's always a thing of like, color is the last thing I do. I don't care about it. It's totally unimportant to me Mm -hmm. until the last percent. But when I send it to you, if it just looks too dark, it's like, oh, this is unwatchable. And it's like, no, 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 you're you're missing everything. And that's that's the same thing with me. If it's like, I I have something where, I'm trying to think of a good example of that one that happened. I think in the most recent one I've done, because I wanted to be more kind of like, um, and it's kind of like a good review from a friend. It was like Slipknot was cyberpunk. And it was kind of like a weird thing to hear, but I was like, that's kind of exactly what I was going for. Rather than if I send it like kind of bare and that's if I want to go for and they don't hear that and it becomes something different. I like, I, you know, if it does some, be something they don't like, I want to hear it. But I also want that vibe to go across and see if everyone likes that first. Hell yeah. I, uh, I want to get to the Spring Fling, the Dream Wake show. Uh, but before I remembered my, my point when we were chatting earlier that I forgot and I wrote it down so we can circle back. Uh, we were talking about singles and EPs and yeah, the benefits of what. And you were talking about when you put out a single that it gives the casual fan an opportunity to become aware of you guys. And I think that's a brilliant word of like, yeah, the single isn't about it isn't about making a fan. It isn't about making someone's favorite song. It's about awareness. It's about putting the chain twist name in the the zeitgeist, I think is the word for like the popular culture it idea, the now. conversation. Uh, it's about putting it in the Instagram algorithm <laughs> enough yeah, times. Yeah. And every time you release a song, the chain twist appears more and more in that algorithm. And so in that sense, the, the job of a single isn't necessarily to be the best song. It's not the job of an album to be someone's favorite piece of art. The job is to be an art that someone likes enough to keep chain twist in your brain. And I think it's a really interesting distinction as we're yeah transitioning to this new world of music. Of it's like, yeah, we're not necessarily making a masterpiece is important. Hopefully the songs are all things we're proud of and I believe they are. Um, but it's also, yeah, it's about awareness as much as it is about generating a true fan of the band. And especially with us being a genre that's kind of like polarizing, not mm-hmm. not like in a huge grand scheme of things, but like, you know, we're in a metalcore scene. Mm-hmm. New metal kind of died years ago, but that's what we are essentially. So it's kind of like, like you said, you want it to be imprinted in someone's brain. Like, oh shit, that's a new wave coming back. I kind of want to gravitate towards that because that seems nostalgic to me. Mm-hmm. Yep, one hundred percent. And yeah, a single does that, and maybe seven songs almost becomes like a. You all said it's it's too much of a uh, obstacle obstacle it's to entry, too much of a commit, barrier to entry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, the single kind of addresses that and also makes it addressing and exciting to kind of do enticing. Yeah. And then if it winds up being someone's favorite song and then bonus, but yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it's like, Oh, but here's, here's a song. Know us, please Mm -hmm. be our, be our friends. Yeah. Yeah. And if you like it, sick, like come back. That's interesting. And yeah, I wonder, I'm just thinking like, I like to scale it then of like, that's the local version and then the bring me the horizon version. It's like, I wonder for them, like I, I would bet that it's still not about making a masterpiece. It's still about making something that's going to turn heads and keep people talking and like it. Yeah. Um, but at yeah. the same time, I'm trying to not make it be the point of making a single. Right. Like yeah. make it for yourselves first and turn heads second. Exactly. That's a, a weird piece that you guys are always battling with. It's like you are, music is a business, right? This whole thing is a business on some level and hopefully someday this grows and making a living, which means money. It means contracts, means all the, the gross underbelly of this that we don't like to think about or talk about. Um, 
but I think the flip side there is it's also completely creative. It has to be completely autonomous, like something that's completely fulfilling and exciting for you for it to ever become a business. How do you balance those two things as you're working on the singles, you're working on the art, the TV, the TV, T-shirt? Uh, it's like we could put the provocative thing out that is kind of us, but mostly just going to get clicks. Or we could put out the thing that is most us, but it's a 45 minute song that no one's ever going to get through. Like, how do you balance those two? I feel like that's something we're just approaching. Yeah, I don't like think we I don't think we try to balance anything like that before, whether rather than it was just us like, hey, like, let's just put our faces out there right now, like put these singles out there, make these t shirts, just as like a hey, this is our vibe. If you're with it, come through, kind yeah. of thing. I think in the end, like at the stage right now, it's mostly we are doing everything kind of for us and just hoping that other people are also into it. So it's we're making music that we want to listen to which I feel like bands obviously say, but like you need to do that. Cause if you don't like your own stuff, then it just turns into a job. Like even if you're making money from it and you're making a living, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, then you might as well just be sitting at a desk. Like it's the same thing. If you That's don't love yeah. what you're doing, then it's just work. And people will catch on that. It's not, yeah, it becomes either. super apparent that you're not into it. That's interesting. Yeah. It, uh, that idea of someone who kind of gets pigeonholed into a genre they don't love, but the, the album has commercial success and now you're stuck in this role. It's yeah, really now you have a choice to make. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, I can keep doing this because it's working or I can do stuff for me. Yeah. And it's not a cubicle. You are on stage. You are close to that thing. But I guess ultimately what you realize is that you have to make the choice. Of, like, is it about the lifestyle or about the act of creating? And I think for most artists, it's probably a mixture of both. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I think last week I was talking about like, the cover band specifically. It's like, that's a really interesting thing. It's like, you will succeed, but there's a level there there where it's like uh, how fulfilling you're kind of detached it from it because it's not really your doing you mm-hmm. get the experience of performing in front of people but like you're not it's not you i guess mm-hmm. so there's yeah. always gonna be that level of detachment it's more of a gimmick than like a i guess genuine kind mm-hmm. of like interest you know what i mean um dream Wake, spring fling so a couple months ago i believe that was your first show is chain twist first show as a unit yes sir how did that go so uh yeah what happened on stage it looked great sounded great i had a great time but what was it on stage that we wouldn't have known sweaty sweaty very foggy hard to breathe Mm -hmm. i don't want to say nerves but more just like we were saying i don't again i don't remember when your last show was but like for me josh and joe we hadn't played in front of people since before COVID as more our last band. So like it wasn't really nerves. It was more just like shaking some rust off and being like, okay, like this is what it's like to play in front of people. And for me personally, I'm not going to speak for the other guys. Like I, every band I was in would play like a Tuesday night at the cave to like seven people in the other bands. So like it was super refreshing to like actually play in front of people that like gave a shit and like liked us. So I was like, hell yeah, the whole time. But uh, did you guys open or were you guys second band? Second band, second. yeah. Uh, Liminal went and then we did. So I forgot. Even then, I think it's a uh, it's a testament to how great Dreamwake is that even that at that point of the night, people were there and excited. Yeah, and yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah. Just a really really great night. We, yeah, yeah. And Sweat, it's a testament fog, to the everything to the aside. scene too that people are willing to come check out bands. Like mm-hmm. obviously, everybody's there for Dreamwake. Like it's a given. But like the fact that people who listen to Dreamwake are also willing to show up early and check out the other bands. Like it's mm-hmm. really a testament to the scene too. Yeah. So yeah. And a testament to their, um, I think it is about Dreamwake and I want to give them credit. I don't oh want to yeah. No, I'm that. never going to take uh, away credit from them. But I think the flip side is like, it is also about us being a community that's willing to go see and 100%. willing to go see. And it's on, it's somewhat on Dreamwake to be inclusive and open, but I think it's also on us as a scene to be like, whoever is on at the Webster is going to be good. Let's go right. see what that is. And yeah. I guess that's probably Justin Leach or whoever the booking guy is yeah. pulling and putting the right people on stage enough times that it's, we're willing to go show up. Definitely. But it's like, we've also been also been to the show where it's like, I know doors are at seven and I'm not going to go in the door before 9 PM. <laughs> oh <laughs> so yeah. Like we've all been in the shows where you're looking at the bill and you're like, okay, well I'm just here to see my friends. Mm-hmm. Like I don't care. But yeah. at the same time, like you got to also be willing to, cause then you're missing out. You could be missing out on, on bands that you're never going to hear about because you're Mm -hmm. um, just going to go at 9 p.m. It'll be fine. Like, not dude. Like, you're paying for the ticket. Like, just go see the whole show. Like, it's... If you don't like a band after the first song, then you can dip out. But, like, at least, like, Mm -hmm. give give the band a song, I guess. But... Uh, you mentioned knocking the rust off. What does that mean? To me, it's like you've played the songs many times. Like I'm sure you've had them practicing. I'm sure you were jumping through pandemic. Yeah. What is what does knocking the rust mean on stage? For me, I'm not going to speak for Josh and Joe, but like for me, it was more just like, 
all right, cool, like change over time. Like let's get everything set up how it needs to be timely manager. And it was, this was my first time this, we play with, with backtracks. It's not a secret. Like we play with production and stuff. I've never done that as a drummer. So like I'm paranoid about making sure the computer's set up and that it's plugged through the right thing. So I hear the click and you don't hear the click. Is it going to be loud enough? Cause I need things to be so out of like <laughs> outer spacely loud for me to hear stuff. So like I'm paranoid that I'm not going to hear clicks and it's going to be a problem. Thank God, Chris, the sound guy at the, the Webster is the homie, because I forgot like a chord, and he's like, I got you. And I'm like, yes. Thank God, like, yeah. Oh, my God, because I was about to just leave and never come back. Yep. Like, if this didn't work, I would just be like, hang it up. I'm done. Um, but everything went super well. Uh, Josh unplugged his like guitar because he was moving around too much at the end, like straight up just ripped the chord out of like his amp. So like things happened, but Dan almost died because there was way too much fog. Mm -hmm. Like, But... Yeah, I was knocking the rust off the similar kind of narrative for you. I know you, I remember we played shows more recently, or I've been with you at shows more recently, I think, than three years before that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, still knocking the rust off. Yeah, what's that experience like for you? In a way, not as far as like playing the songs, but like playing the songs with a purpose, not just like going through the motions and practice, yeah, I guess. And like yeah. trying to figure out what I'm going to say between songs, what I'm going to say in songs, or like, and plus too, like obviously we've practiced a million times, but we don't really know how we move on stage. So it's also trying to figure out like, Hey, like when can I go this way and not yeah. crash into Josh or crash into Joe? Um, I guess like I was also knocking off a little bit of nerves cause obviously I've played shows as far back as 2020, but that's still three years back, but also I haven't played a Connecticut show since like 2017. So like it was more like nerves of like excitement again. Cause like the Webster is like a venue I felt most at home at when I've played in previous bands. So like, Playing that again was awesome and like seeing all the friends and everything. But it's also like the nerves of like trying to put on a good show for those friends and like make it worth the time to come see yeah, us. It was definitely the anticipation more than anything of just like because we had been waiting. We had been a band for like a year before this. Finally, we did everything backwards where like normally you write some songs, you would play some shows you're like, cool, people like us. Let's go record songs like we did literally everything backwards. So we've been sitting on all of this for over a year the original homie fest was supposed to happen in like December and everything just kept getting moved because scheduling and everything. So we're like, Oh, this is finally happening. We're here. We're all in the building. This can't get moved. Like it's just this kind of like funnel of adrenaline for us that we were like, Oh, people are going to see us now. Like it's all of this. Cause you can only create like artificial adrenaline. Like at practice so much before it's like, no one's here. It's fine. Just mail it in. Like, getting to be in front of people and have that like visceral reaction where it's like, okay, like people like us or don't, but like people are having a reaction. Like you can only do that live. So like having the year kind of, I guess, pay off in a way where it's like, cool, we're out here now. Like that was kind of the build up to it. Where it was just the anticipation finally paying off and all of the work that we've been putting in behind the scenes, like people like knowing what change this is about mm -hmm. now, I guess is definitely the biggest part for us. Yeah, I'd argue you said it was backwards. and I'd almost argue that it's not backwards. It's like the modern approach where I think uh, back back in the past, you would have played shows to gain a fan base. And it's like, no, no, no. Now you put music on YouTube and Spotify to gain a fan base and you play shows to kind of celebrate that. Like, I think those two, uh, the, the functions of those two things has almost completely switched. Of yeah. Like, uh, yeah. And especially back then where like you couldn't just go to like a, a friend's house and record something or do it on your own. You had to like go to Much a studio a and spend thousands of dollars just to make a demo. To then be like, hey, is this cool enough for you to come see us? No. Well, fuck, we made some money. like, shit. Dude, my favorite old, uh, uh, for what it's worth, if you guys would like any more drinks, feel free to help yourself and stand up and do whatever. Um, but my favorite like old thing is like, yeah, there's a time in studios where like they were tracking to film, which isn't crazy. But what is weird to me there is like, so film is a physical asset and there's times where like, the singer's in the studio with the track ready and you're like, no, we ran out of film. Like someone has to go to the store, the film store, whatever Maybe that, I don't know. Run. Yeah, I'm sure it's, yeah, and I'm sure whatever that is is not as simple as it is nowadays. Like I'm, that idea of like, yeah, we have, that is not a thing, like audio files are so small that like, I don't think any, so I'm sure someone, but it's very uncommon that like your audio project is ruined because your computer filled up. Yeah. Like the uh, filling computer with audio projects uh, seems uh, even, insane. Even then, okay. you get, like, I just get a hard drive. Uh, like, all right, here. Or find a flash drive, delete the, something, yeah, yeah, exactly. whatever. Yeah, it, R it's, it's RP solvable. MacBook. <laughs> <laughs> MacBook. It's so funny. Video files are so big that I always look at audio files as like a, such a luxury. Like, oh, you got, pff, don't even worry about it. You don't have to worry about anything. It seems so simple, but I guess it all adds up over time. I mean, I'm probably prepared for my file size as well as audio people never seem to be. Um, hell yeah. Anything else from the first first show back that was kind of surprising, stood out, 
uh, unexpected, weird, challenging? I think it's unexpected how well it went mm-hmm. for like just for us, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's like we we going into it, we were like, okay, there's gonna be a couple of hiccups here and there, and and there kind of was. But I guess it was more unexpected the the reception of mm-hmm. everything and how many people dug it. Like we were going into it with no expectation, just like hey, let's go play a show, see how it goes, have fun with it, and that's it. And that's kind of like what our general kind of vibe in the band is anyway, just have fun. But it was kind of cool and also rewarding, like how many people came up to us and were like, "You guys were awesome!" Yeah, like, like and how many people were rad. like, not like of oh man, hey, grit set kind of thing of like a genuine like, yo, this was awesome like mm-hmm. this stuck me i want to come see you guys again yeah like people that weren't in bands like obviously our friends came up and be like yo that's sick and like they meant it but they're our friends like it's it was super cool to people like i've never even met before and that i know weren't in like the other bands like yo like that was tight and i'm like oh my god you like my band <laughs> like it's so <laughs> sick because like it's cool to hear like everybody's like yo it was it was sick because like you're always going to be your own worst critic and you're like i mean like it was good but like I missed that symbol. Like we were talking earlier, like I should have missed like symbols, like multiple times, just like didn't swung in air. So like the fact that like we were able to put on a good enough show overall where like, you, no one cares about the little things. It's just like, Oh, the energy was up. People were moving. And that's in the end, all we care about. It's like, yeah, we want to play well, but if we can just create the atmosphere that people want to mosh, people want to sing, people like want to just move, or you want to stand on the back with your arms crossed. It doesn't matter if you're having a good time, like all we really care about. So I think that's the thing, like Dan was saying, like we didn't want to expect anything and we we're trying not to be like, this is going to be awesome. But like, it's hard not to like get excited about to, yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So like, we we're like, it's going to be sick. It's going to be awesome. It was definitely a sleepless night going into it. Oh, a hundred percent. A bit of a calming. You got to calm yourself down a bit. But like I, you were had Andrew from Dreamicon. He was talking about how like they say, I was just like, oh, just jamming with the boys. And like, we don't do that. But like, I listened to that. And I was like, that's basically what you got to do. Like you I can't, love that. Yeah. you can't build it up. Cause then like, if you set the bar so high, you're never going to meet it. It's so like, you got to just go and you got to do what you can control. You got to play your songs. And if people like it, sick, there's nothing you could do about it. Uh, yeah, that's that principle you shared has stuck with me of this idea of like, 100%. Uh, don't take anything too seriously. You trust that you've done this a thousand times and you're just going to do it again in some version. And yeah. for sure it stuck with me in, in camera stuff of like when I'm at the the place that I feel insecure, or whatever that shoot may be. Uh, it's like, no, I've done this a thousand times. And like, this is a different We're context. Good. There's a different client that maybe is scary or someone on set is intimidating or a manager that I'm nervous about. But it's yeah. like. No, I'm just I'm not jamming with the boys, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. like, whatever but you are. Like, is. it's just yeah. such an applicable, like, even if you're not jamming, like, just jam with the boys, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. it's just it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Another takeaway is. Shout out, Andrew. Um, none on our end, but, like, just the reception that Dreamwake got that night. Too. Oh, my God. Dude. Like, sitting and watching that, it's just like, dang, dude. Like, it, it was, it made me feel amazing seeing how they can just sell out the Webster now. And like, how if that's everybody not inspiring. Know, and it's not like, a, okay, you brought like a bunch of friends. Like everybody was there to see Dreamwake and yeah. like knew every single word. It was just kind of just rewarding on our end to see that as well. Yeah. Like, And I think also like the, the Dreamwake phase has seemed successful, but there's a lot of years before that, before those guys were there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like Bobby, me and Bobby started oh. our first band together. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like to watch like how far he's come like individually, yeah. I'm just like, dude, like I'm so proud of him. I'm so stoked for him and all of them in Dreamwake. Like, I don't know them as well as Dan mm-hmm. does, but like, you be able to watch that set and just be like, yo, this is insane. Like, and it's, if it's not, if that's not inspiring to like all the other bands that were also like playing on that show and you look at that and be like, that's going to be us. Like, mm-hmm. then you got something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Just to be able to watch, and like Dan said, like everybody knows every word. Everybody's there lined up for merch. Just like the whole night, the point like Webster had to be like, yo, get out. <laughs> like they were kicking people out because they were just selling merch and everybody just wanted to hang out. Like that's so sick. So yeah, like that's obviously got to be like a goal for everybody when it's like mm-hmm. cool, like that's where you want to get to and then more. But hell yeah. yeah. Uh, I wanted to dive in. You kind of alluded to some of the early band days. It's a great segue to some of the old stuff. You knew it was coming. Um, what I <laughs> would like to start with here, uh, my first thing here is the graphic design part of this. So I think we've all learned music stuff and you mentioned that you have design and I think you said you have school, like formal education in design, yeah, which is yeah. interesting to me. Uh, so yeah, where does the graphic design start? What is that graphic design journey like? In terms of band stuff or just like my... Uh, in general, yeah. Yeah, so I went to Quinnipiac University. I was originally majoring as a comp sci, a computer science major. and taking a couple classes in high school. I'm like, you yeah, know, programming school, I guess. Um, went, my floor mate, 
was a graphic design major. So I was just hanging out with him and he just had his laptop, like intro to graphic design, like learning how to open Photoshop, like not even do anything. And he's sitting there, he's got like his first product up. I forgot what it was, but I just looked at him like, yo, what are you doing? It's like, oh, I'm doing Photoshop. And I had like heard of it, but like in my brain, it was just so foreign. I'm like, Photoshop was editing faces and bodies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm like, art. yo, yeah. you can do that. And he's like, yeah, apparently. I'm like, you can major in that. And he's like, yeah, I literally got up and went to my advisor. Like, didn't even think about it. I was just like, I want to change my major and just did it. Like no <laughs> thought, no sleep on it. Just literally saw my floor mate on a Photoshop doing nothing. Cool. And I was just like, I'm in. I'm, Sounds good. I'm laughing. I'm also missing the point. But to me, Photoshop is so uninviting that it's like it's <laughs> absurd that someone could see that and be like, yes, I want more. I don't know what like he was doing some because like the intro I was saying, like the my first project I ever had to do was like just teaching how to make selections and like cut stuff out of other things and drop it. So it was just like make 20 selections and make a collage. So I'm like sitting here with like Pac-Man eating a goldfish cracker like on the Empire State Building and it looks terrible. But in my brain, I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of taking all that, going through school and being graduating with a degree that you can get on. I always say, I joke, I'm like, I'm an idiot because I went to a nursing and law school for a degree that you can Google like and just YouTube how do I Photoshop. <laughs> But like I paid more than all of you guys, so obviously I'm better. Yeah, like yeah. it's just so yeah. like depressing. I'm like, dang, I could have just like YouTube it. It's whatever. But yeah, it always has come in handy because now it's like, oh, we need album art. Like every band, like we need album art, rad. I can do that. Like we need merch, cool. Like we started outsourcing, but like most of the time, like I'm kind of not like everybody's like you're the merch guy, but like I just take it upon myself because I have the background where it's like, oh, cool, I can I can just do that. I think the other thing with you guys being so in-house and so with your graphic design and also just generally with production and with all the other things we got going on here, uh, it also helps you have the conversations when you're coming to me, when you're going to Sean, when you're working on the next steps of this. And for me, it's like I've learned to play guitar a little bit and it, not that I'm going to join a band or do anything, but it's helpful for me to talk about frets and hands and whatever, just have some sense of what is going on. Yeah. And I think for you guys, it must be a very similar thing that it's yeah helpful to have the vocabulary of it all. Uh, as the graphic design has the you kind of joked with a degree has the degree provided value to you in your eyes or do you feel like you could have gone to YouTube and done it that way no I mean honestly like every like it was great to really what actually so really what my degree I feel like got me the most was not even the graphic design it was how to take constructive criticism because all of my professors were the shit they were so cool like first name basis like we had a very small department because Quinnipiac is like mostly law nursing so our um department like my senior class of graduating people was maybe like 18 kids so we were all super tight super tight with the professors but they were very hard on us and like openly like hey we are not gonna let anything slide because in the real world like if you're going to this you're gonna have to answer these questions so you would present your project and they'd be like why'd you pick that font and you'd be like uh because comic sans looks cool like you had to explain everything so and then if it sucked, you're getting told it sucked. Like, there's no, like, eh, you know, you did good. It's like, no, this is garbage. You just, you literally have to start over. And I was like, oh, okay. To the point where, like, now, outside of even just design, like, I just don't give a shit. Like, people can be like, hey, you wrote that song. The song sucks. I'd be like, okay. Like, what do you think? And they'd be like, you should change this. I'd be like, rad. Okay, let's change that then. It's so, like becoming detached from your art kind of that's what I guess my degree helped me most. Mm -hmm. That's so, like, so valuable though. I, yeah. uh, everyone who is who I've chatted to has been through some kind of art school has had a similar narrative to that of like, I don't know if the, if the creative process was the most nourishing part of it, but certainly the, the social aspect or the communicative part of it has been incredible. 100%. Uh, and the other piece of that, that I think is interesting is you get good at taking something from your brain to your hand. So someone says, make i don't know what a photoshop assignment is but you get experience of going from i have this idea this vision and how does it come out of my hands and that's a i never thought of that jake said it last week and it struck me as like a i've been working to learn a new software and it's been that same thing of like yeah how do i get stuff from my head to my hands and it's a really interesting problem yeah. of like yeah and i guess somehow on a guitar you can play the note and i guess even then you have to find the note and make that work uh, but it's a really interesting problem to me of like yeah this thing is in my head but it's not worth anything <laughs> inside yeah. of my two years like it has to get out of me somehow before it has any value yeah it's super convenient having like all of the background and like having individuals in your band having like background in certain things like i don't know anything about gear josh and joe will talk for days about pedals and amps and all this kind of stuff and i would just be sitting there like <laughs> 
what are you talking about? But like having all of that, if something breaks, they know what they're doing. Like they know how to communicate the problem, like graphic design, video, like and stuff like, oh, we have this idea, but we're out. So like we're, we're going to someone else. Like I can be like a bridge to like, cause I know what is talking about like production and stuff. Like every, everybody knows a little bit about something that doesn't have really something to do with the band that comes into play and is useful when it needs to be. So it's really nice to have. And I feel like a lot of bands have that because like Andrew does the graphic design and like Nick does the graphic design for Have Art. So like having kind of like the go-to like, oh, you're the design guy or you're the sound guy or the gear guy. Like having that has been like super versatile and definitely very, very helpful. Like it's like that work environment thing. I'm exactly. like, we, we need to, when the coffee machine breaks, I need to know who I can go talk to. Yeah, who's the so thankfully, guy. we're at problems that are more intricate and fun to solve than coffee machines. But to some degree, that that problem solving mechanism strategy has to exist of like, yeah, when we need a song, I need to know I can tap. When, uh, when yeah, my mix is messed up, I need to know I can text Dan and be like, Dan, how, how does this, what am I, I don't, doing? Yeah, I don't know what doll you're working in, but yeah, how does blah, blah, blah software work and where do I find blah, blah, blah in this or uh, yeah, my mic won't turn on, Dan. How do I how do I fix it? <laughs> Flip the switch. Um, turn it off and turn switch. it back on again. Um, it's Dan, my uh, thought for you. So last, obviously, you were here five months ago, which feels crazy. It feels like yeah, it, it feels, hasn't been that long at all. It feels like it's been a couple um, of weeks, yeah. Yeah, it's been five months. So it's wild, wild to me that I've been talking, talking in my basement for that long. But it's been fun. It's been <laughs> a really fun journey. Uh, the one thing I don't think we brought up last time that I wanted to dive into is... Uh, so at some point in 2019, 2020, we're on tour together and we're in Louisiana working on an EP uh, and we're in the studio uh, with Zach Keel, who might listen. I don't know. Maybe Jimmy does. I don't know. Shout out to all the Louisiana homies. Dude, if they I, do. I miss them so um, much. Dude, they're the best. Uh, but they're all killing it, crushing it. Jimmy's going to be coming through the area this summer, actually. He's touring. Uh, and there's some dates. That's all probably off my conference. Not that it is not whatever. It's boring for the listener. <laughs> I guess is what I'm getting at. Uh, but Jimmy, shout Buy out. Buy the tickets. Um, yeah, go do something. Um, <laughs> Promotion. But we're in the studio uh, and we're starting to track the U with Keel uh, and Josh Landry is the one producing at this moment. Yeah. Uh, and so it was an interesting thing where it feels like the first time I've seen someone like get better at something in front of my eyes or like unlock a door or something. And I was I wanted to hear your kind of take on it. So my memory is that we're in the studio and Josh is kind of talking you through vocals. And it felt yeah. like he really helped you like unlock something or access something, find something. And I didn't like it doesn't make sense to me because vocals to me are something that you shouldn't be able to get better at. And I know that isn't true. But it seems like it's this inside thing of like, it's impossible to me to imagine talking to someone to make their vocal cords yeah. <laughs> do better. So in my case, it was a, it was a sense of, uh, I thought I demolished you with the mic stand. Um, it was a case of, I had a technique I used a while ago that blew up my voice pretty well. And I was kind of scared to go back to. So I learned another way of just going about things. And it just wasn't working out well sonically mm -hmm. with the songs. So yeah, it was him tap having me tap back into that and like trying to get over the fear of like hey dude don't like you're not don't worry about like blowing your chords again like here's like throat coat was a big introduction mm -hmm. to me that was my first time ever having it we literally left a project like as is and we just dipped and just went to go get some mm -hmm. but it was also like a, a good amount of like motivation for it too of like having like that second year be like hey like that's going to sound really cool. Like you're going to be fine. Like I thought it was an interesting testament to Josh also and to everyone who's in the studio that day. Uh, Cause it like, everything sounded cool to me. Like I was happy yeah. to that point. Like I, I wasn't like I was hearing the vocal takes and being like, yo, fucking Dan's got to step it up, brother. <laughs> like I was hearing everything and being like, yo, this is sick. This sounds cool. This sounds like what I would hope it would sound like. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, somehow the, the expert in the room was able to discern it better and be like, no, 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 there is an extra percentage here. Yeah. Um, and the, even like going back into that style, like, when I said it was sort of a little bit monotone, because then I was, if I went to go deeper, I'd go to like a different whole thing. Um, and, and it's all boring talk anyway, but it was more of like just stretching that out and like finding different avenues of what I can do with that and trying to kind of like, I guess, rediscover myself in a way. How like, this is going to be a hard question to answer and I'm trying to think of a better way to word it, but how like conscious of you, of your voice as you're screaming. So to me, it seems like you can yell and go high or low but as I remember being in eighth grade and watching like screaming tutorials or whatever, they'd always be like, you know, put your tongue here, use your diaphragm here. Like how much do you feel like you're able to control those? How much is it just you've done it enough yet? And the control and the, I guess, confidence really not really a big factor to me because I'm just so used to doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. I guess when I first started, I was super conscious of how it sounds. Nowadays, I'm just, I'm very comfortable with everything mm -hmm. where like 
And the whole like tongue rolling thing, that's really all feel. Like obviously some techniques to get some sounds, you need to do that, but you don't have to like necessarily have to do like a million different like pig squeals or like guttural mm-hmm. to sound good, right? Yeah. So it's like f- kind of like finding your lane and just staying with it. And then you just get so used to it, it's all muscle memory. It's a, it's a weird one because uh, yeah, screaming is so... If you didn't know what you were looking at, it would seem so untalented, unskilled. Like Yeah, and, then and there's you, a lot that goes into it, too. Like Yeah, it's one of those weird art forms where it's like, if you don't know what you're looking at, it looks like nothing. And I'm trying to think of a good parallel here, another, I don't know, knitting or something. It's like, if you don't know how to knit, looking at a sweater is nothing. And once you know how to knit, it's like, oh, wow, there's seven patterns weaved in and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Uh, and I think, yeah, screaming is another example. Like, singing, we've all kind of tried. Guitar, we've all held an acoustic guitar enough times to be like, I don't understand how this thing works. And you see someone doing it, it's like, oh, cool, got it. Yeah, because to, to the normal ear, it's just like loud noises. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like, yeah, yeah. But when you, like, and I was the same way when I was first getting into like, I mean, I grew up with like um, like Black Sabbath, like mm-hmm. all those like nine, like late 70s, early 80s, like White Riot shit. But like when I first started hearing like really heavy stuff, and I remember it was Slipknot. And I remember hearing that, I was like, what the f- fuck is this like i don't understand anything and i was one of those people at first for like for a good while but then i started getting more of appreciation for it to where like it's more of an expression but also there's a lot that you have to do to get that sound and to like also do it safely yeah it's such a weird thing because yeah it seems so casual uh, and part of that is because we only or we consume so many people who are experts at it right i mean it gets mm-hmm. it's like it's like baseball like you don't really see a lot of mid-tier baseball you see four-year-olds and professional baseball players and we're unaware of the middle tiers of it yeah. to lot, or i am i guess and i'm realizing i'm talking to a baseball person so you're more aware of it than other people and the connection um, you can make but, to that is like hitting a ball right yeah people say so oh you just hit a ball and run like cool but like you don't also understand you have like point like yeah, that ball moves fast you, you have like point 20 seconds to see where the ball is going decide if you want to swing or not and also get out of the way if it's coming at you mm-hmm. like it, there's more to it than it seems and but you can also make that a test that testament to everything now something i guess in the, i guess to me the discernment there is like in in baseball too, there's a physical thing and i can see that if i took a video of me and i guess if i took a recording of my voice i would hear but i don't know somehow it seems like i watch a baseball and it's like nothing in me makes me think i could do that i'm like yeah, that's a guy who's done it a lot. I see someone scream, and it's like, yeah, for sure I could figure that out in a week. And it's like, yeah. no, it's it's not at all that. Uh, it's just, yeah, a weird, weird one in that sense. Um, hell yeah, dudes. Uh, Chain Twist songs to start with. So uh, for someone who is listening to this and has never listened to Chain Twist, isn't too familiar with you guys, uh, where do they start? What do you tell them to send out? I would kind of honestly point to Feral if I had to pick. Yeah, I feel like probably Feral is kind of where we decided that the kind of bridge is, I guess. Because mm-hmm. the first three, the three songs that we have out now, Kerosene, Purge, and Feral, I guess Kerosene was a demo Dan had. Purge and Feral, I kind of put together like in the very early stages of Change Twist. So that's kind of us like figuring out what are we doing here? Like, what is this going to be? Feral, I think, is kind of like the, the gap between what we're going to be doing and then we've kind of talked about it as the four of us where dead to me is kind of like the Genesis, like I as corny as it, but like the, like this is chain twist. This is kind of what we're going to be like, what you can expect. Like this is us kind of finding it where the first three songs are kind of like chain twist, but definitely more like a, like a prelude than, than anything where it's some trial and error stuff. And yeah. And as for the ones that are already out, I think Farrell has like the biggest like dynamics mm-hmm. in a way. Because it has different vocal patterns and kerosene and purge whatever. It's just like, okay, scream, 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 chorus, scream, whatever. And this one had like distortion on my voice and like kind of like taking like a different approach to the verses where it's more talking, going into a scream, then back. Um, was it also the first song you guys did? Like, obviously, the first one you released. Was it the first one you recorded? First change? No, song? That was, everything we've released and recorded has all been in order. In order. So, kerosene and purge, we did in. May of 2022. Yeah, I want to say like April or May with Sean came out in July, and then we wound up doing Feral maybe like September. We sat on that for a while and put it out in January because we were trying to do like a bigger, we we're trying to come up with like a bigger video concept and wind up just like, let's just do it. And it's like, we're waiting too long. It's been forever and just put it out. But 
That's a classic band question of like, we all have some, some degree of perfectionism of like, we want the thing to be right. And yeah. to some degree, that's what makes all of us artists. That's part of what being the artist is. It's like, it's saying that it, it should be this, but I want it to be here and right. I'm going to keep it here. And that process can go on forever. And it's an interesting thing that, yeah, whether it's the graphic design, the audio, whatever the context is, we all have that thing of like, fuck, when is this thing done? How do we yeah. decide when it's done? And for bands, it's like I hear so many bands who are paralyzed in that where it's like they end up doing nothing because they're so waiting for the right video and the right yeah. thing. And it's like now putting it out was the right choice, putting it out. Yeah. And, and I guess you can right. kind of count this as like, oh, hey, this is kind of like dead to me. Like the next one is going to be like the one thing that like kind of solidifies is like realizing that's probably like he said, the genesis of like, hey, this is now changed with sound is when we were recording with Sean. Like the first thing he said when we sound done was like, this feels like change with mm-hmm. to us. And I yeah. guess that was kind of like us like realizing okay we found it yeah. we found our niche like and now we've been building off that and so i guess what you can hear in that is kind of i guess i can say it's what people would expect in other the songs afterwards but there's also so many differences and like so many different avenues we go down now yeah. but i guess when you tie that one and the old ones together you'll realize like okay this is how it's become like this is how it started here it is now it still ties in together Here's what's next, and that's going to tie in together even with the old stuff too. Yeah, definitely having Sean, like Dan said, Sean, who's an outside uh, like ear to listen and hasn't been sitting with these songs as long as we have, and he immediately was like, "Yeah, this is this is it." Like having Sean as kind of like that fifth member of Shane Twist, like he gets it, and it's just been so valuable for us. Like we saying, like we sit with these songs mm-hmm. forever. So like to have. Um, like first listen when we're recording and Sean just be like yeah like this is this is the one like that kind of just like dance up just solidifies like got it we, we figured this thing out here like we're doing we're doing something right hell so yeah. hell yeah dude good to be up on the up and up uh as we move towards we're moving towards our hour here uh, as we move towards the wrapping up uh I would like to talk about what we do for fun so stuff outside of this and my my thing here is I'm so bad at having fun like this is my day off this is what I'm doing for fun today you tell uh, me about it. and I enjoy what I do I love creating music videos and all the content all the traveling I do and it's all fun but I enjoy it so much that other things aren't as fun and then when I am home it's like I've been to all the bars I've been to all the shows like I just want to be on my couch in my living room and that is the satisfying unfulfilling it's un, not beneficial for me in the big picture what are you guys doing for fun outside of music stuff outside of yeah when the demos are done when the graphic design stuff's done what's happening next i mean i guess we touched on it the last episode but i play a lot of sports outside mm-hmm. i guess it's kind of like my men's way of, stuff yeah and all that like baseball and softball yeah but, i mean i guess outside of that like a, video games are always fun um that are like going fishing is a uh, huge staple to my summer my my dilemma with men's leagues, and I'm being being very cynical here, but my dilemma is just like I don't like it's fun to go play, but I just don't get it. I'm like all these guys like it's it it seems like a lot of it is fun, and there's some guys there who are taking it so seriously that I'm like, so yo, this serious. is it's so this stupid. is so stupid. And like if yeah. if everyone could be like like I think if you and I and our clones could go play, like it would be a ton of fun. Yeah. But I feel like with men's leagues, it's like there's one guy who is already drunk and also taking it the most seriously somehow like somehow that's the same guy in every league yeah. <laughs> and it's like i don't i have no interest in getting involved in it. like i, I see i like- feel like i got lucky in that aspect is every team i play on is just having fun mm-hmm. and you know you have guys that are like very good and you have a very good team but like in the end when you're having fun like that's all that matters like no one's coming from like the yankees to come scout you at mm-hmm. like a wallingford softball game at nine o'clock at night that three people just are dox at. himself by the way if yeah, i'm going yeah. to wallingford nine yo yo i mean if there, me there's a night hit me up but uh no but bring a sign <laughs> but no that's that's the kind of thing i feel like i lucked out on mm-hmm. um but i very much agree like the people who take it way too serious just make it not fun anymore that's what like i grew up playing hockey so mm-hmm. like i dabbled in the hockey men's league for a while and god it's just so annoying especially like I mean, it's the same. Like, all adult sports have to be, like, 10 p.m. because all the youth sports, like, it makes sense. But, like, dude, it's Tuesday. It's 1130. I'm in, like, West Haven. I'm a half hour away from my house. Like, I'm not trying to deal with you, like, slashing my ankle right now because you got upset. Mm -hmm. Like, what are we doing? So, like, it really kind of ruins it with the people who are, like, trying to make up for, like, lost time or whatever. I'm like, last time I checked, we are not winning anything here. And if you are, it's, like, the little participation size trophy like there's zero people in the stands there's you still nobody. have to give it back at the end of the night yeah so like guys runs the league <laughs> like you paid the same amount of money i did to be here like can yeah. we not do this right now there so. is like a there is a value to fun there must be 
And I guess for me, it's the the fear of not having fun that stops me, which I guess is bullshit on my end. Yeah. But it is also just like a, I don't know, I don't do anything half-assed. Like to me, it's like, I'm going to go play in a men's league. I'm going to fucking be running every day. I'm going to be working out every day. So that Thursday night when it's 1130, <laughs> I'm ready for this thing. Like I don't have a, a the part of my brain that allows me to just show up and play the thing is like it doesn't and, and that's normal and i'm kind of the same way where like if i'm there i want to put in the effort mm-hmm. like yeah. if i'm there i want to dash in 90 as hard as i can mm-hmm. like i don't want to go there half ass and then like you know that screws us but like i, I also like have a guy. social awareness too where if it's like yeah. i want to be the guy like i'll if we're taking this seriously if everybody collectively unspoken instantly is like oh we're gonna play mm-hmm. i'm like all right cool but if like you show up and like everybody's just kind of chilling like we're just hanging out then all right like you don't want to be the yeah. one guy who's like the try hard at the pickup, like have fun. But if everybody's on the same page, then like, that's what you want to do. Like you flip the switch. Like, I feel like everybody's got like, oh, we're doing this. Okay, cool. Like, but yeah, it's kind of like reading the room. It's like, all right, we're hanging out today. Everybody's chilling. We're going half speed. Sounds mm-hmm. good. Like, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I'm uh I'm like a puppy still. I need to like get into the adult dog body to like be able to like <laughs> chill and like relax and like <laughs> settle into the world still. Uh, Ryan, I know you're rock climbing outside of outside. Yeah, of I'm a big music ro- stuff. I'm a big rock climber. Um, Where does that start? That's not a not a traditional. Yeah, activity. I don't know. I used to. Uh, I would have birthday parties. Like my parents had a birthday party that I was there once, like when I was real little. But like mm-hmm. I didn't. That's not. It didn't stick. Really. Like we used. Me and Dan. I used to work at Sky Zone. Um, rest in peace. Uh, Never forget. And never forget. Um, and just a couple people like just went, like would go every now and then. And um, I got dragged along, like, yo, you should come with us. I'm scared of heights. I'm terrified of heights. I'm like, no, I don't think. And like, no, they got short walls. It's cool. Um, so I went, fell in love with it immediately. I'm like, this is like my thing. I love this. So everybody else kind of fell out of it, but me and our friend Tez would go all of the time like it was the two of us we would just go like every week we were going we were going we were going just getting better this like a membership thing or yeah well we were at the time they would do it where they're like passes they do day passes and every monday it was like ten dollars and you can go climb as long as you want so we would just go once every monday and then um Tez wound up joining the army, moved to Kentucky. So it was kind of just me. And I'm like, I still like it. And then the more I was going, I was starting to meet other people. And then I got a good job that I was like able to afford a a membership. So I was going like five times a week. Like during the pandemic, when they finally opened, I was there literally every day. Because there was nothing else to do. So I was just getting super good at it. And then eventually wound up getting a job, like part-time job just to like offset stuff. And just became this thing where... I got invited by some friends and just turned into like, oh, this is like my thing. Like, this is what I do. Yeah. I, but, I think that's the other uh, thing I should be aware of is like, uh, as I do it more, it'll be more fun. And like this first yeah. time, it's like, it's never fun. And it's a fun way to like exercise without like going to the gym. Cause like, it's one thing to go to the gym, but like, that's boring. Mm-hmm. Like lift up, put down, like you don't do anything. Like you're doing a lot. Don't get me wrong. Like you're doing things, but like, this is more of a like, Oh, I'm not conscious that I'm exercising. Like I'll bring friends. Like I brought Dan before and he's like 15 minutes and it's just like, I can't feel my arms. What am I doing? Like, and everybody's like that. I'm like, you got to just power through because that's the biggest thing. People are like, I want to come rock climbing with you. I'm like, you could, but like, you got to understand that it's like a three month commitment before you're like, oh, this is fun. Like, cause it works all kinds of stuff that you don't even know you have. It's Mm -hmm. the best. I would highly encourage everybody to do it. I went a couple times in high school. Uh, and there was a story there that please remind me for after the podcast. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to yeah. Tell you about. Um, but I went a couple times in high school. I remember, yeah, it's all grip strength. All um, grip strength. You should come. You should yeah. come with us. You should come with me. I probably would enjoy it. I uh, I have a pull up bar here that I hang from a lot because I feel like when I'm filming, it's my hands that always fail me. Like that is the, the I compare filming to like yoga where it's like nothing I'm doing seems hard, but if you had to do it Very all day, hard. then you're just like it Fuck, adds up. Your back yeah. is shot. Uh, and so for me, it's always my hands are the one thing. So I've been like hanging and trying. Yeah. Dude, Drink if you want to come, train. let me know. Um, well, it'll be fun. I'll figure that out at some point. That's what she said. Um, it'll be fun if you want to come. Yeah, that's a great place to end this one. I think we've had enough <laughs> for today. Um, Here we go, boys. No, nah, boys. I appreciate y'all coming through. I appreciate y'all making this happen. Uh, so Change us is live on Spotify, YouTube, everywhere that music exists. Probably. Yeah. Uh, where do people find you guys? Where do they come tell you that you're cute and awesome and super awesome and everything? Oh, I live at... Um, <laughs> uh, My yeah, social security number is... Yeah, well, funny story about that. Yeah, I'll tell you that offline. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Best Buy. 
Um, yeah, Shane Twist. <laughs> Yo, shout got, out Best Buy, by the shout way. Shout out Best yeah. Buy Identity Theft. Um, we've got uh, <laughs> all the social Swan media. Is, <laughs> Yo, for real, I'll tell you about it. Um, we got Chain Twist. I think it's just Chain Twist underscore because for some reason people know what Chain Twist is. So, like, all of the normal Chain Twists are taken. So, Chain Twist underscore TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever people use, we probably have. We don't probably use it, but it's there. If you want to follow, uh, new song dead to me is coming out whenever we we do it uh stay tuned i guess yeah um and yeah dude chain chain twist chain twist dan where do people find you and tell you that you are cute oh man that's few and far between no i'm just kidding uh no it's just my name everywhere yeah it's also just my name i didn't realize that was a personal question it's also just my name too yeah dude it's all the questions personal impersonal public private it's yeah it's a multi two oh three nine two seven question <laughs> hell yeah friends uh i appreciate y'all coming through episode 24 mission accomplished